But thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm Ashok Ramani uh, with Kecker and Van Nest. We have an, an august panel up here. Uh, I think you know all of these folks, and I'm just honored to be up here with them. It's Ed Rhinus from Wild Gotchel, Daryl and Dury from Dury Tongri, Matt Powers from Tensegrity Law Group. Uh, we have Professor Love from Santa Clara, and we have Professor Landers from McGeorge, but soon to be from Drexel uh, as of the next academic year. So our panel is focused on litigation abuse uh, in patent cases. Uh, we want to get as much audience participation as we can. So we encourage you, hopefully the speakers you know, won't cause a riot, but we expect that they'll be somewhat provocative. And so if you hear something that you really just really gets you and you don't feel like you can wait until get the last five minutes to, to get up and ask a question, feel free to raise your hand. Feel free to just jump up and ask and, and we'll try and, try and incorporate you, incorporate what you, what, what you want to hear. Um, I guess the first question um, we have is that the, the title of our, our panel presupposes that there are litigation abuses uh, in patent litigation. And so can we just see a show of hands from the audience how many people in the audience feel that at the present day in the U.S. system, there are litigation abuses in patent litigation? Okay, so not everybody. Maybe it looks like a somewhat of a majority, but, but, but it's not as many as I'd expected. How about on the panel? How many of you folks feel like there are litigation abuses today in the patent system? Okay, good. Um, how many of you folks feel like those abuses are endemic to the system and don't have anything to do with one side or the other trying to improperly take advantage. Any, anybody? Is that too balanced a statement? Okay. How many of you, how many of you believe that um, the litigation abuses predominantly occur on the patentee side of things? It's the patentees and the lawyers representing them who are engaging in abuse. Okay. How many of you believe that um, it, the abuse predominantly occurs on the defense side of things? It's defendants who are predominantly engaging in abuse. All right, so those of you, who, two of you didn't raise your hands. Um, Matt, Matt and Amy, uh, why don't you start off, tell us what your views are on that topic. I object to the way the question's asked. I think that, <laughs> I think that there's abuse on both sides of the V, for sure. Uh, and I think that to, to ask whether it's predominantly on one side or the other is sort of thinking about it the wrong way. It's, there are different types of abuses on different types of the V. And the question, I think, for the, for the House today is identifying exactly what abuse there is and then thinking about what can be done to solve it on both sides of the V. And hey, Amy? My view is that um, if you give someone the ability to propagate discovery, it is going to impose costs on the other side. If you're looking at a competitor case, either side has the ability to do that. And people do take advantage of it um, to uh, sort of an extreme degree. Uh, if you're looking at the troll litigation problem specifically, uh, certainly the patentee has more of an opportunity to do that because they don't have uh, quite as much in terms of the discovery that they can respond to. And so it naturally falls harder on defendants in patent cases where there is this troll litigation. And then you have the re related problem of the defendants creating uh, a problem of their own creation, which is they complain about the cost of asserting 456 prior art references against the patent in suit, where they know they're only going to rely on three by the time they get to trial, and then ask to be reimbursed for the cost of dealing with all the prior art references that was just churning in the first place. This going to your point that um, there are different types of ab litigation abuse that occur on both sides of the V, plaintiffs and defendants. And, and they're animated by different things, and different things can be done to solve or reduce both of those. I mean, I, th I think one of the points made in the earlier panel is right. Any system that you devise, people are going to try to exploit it to their benefit. That's, that's human nature. Uh, and you know, the question is, how far are you going to go in, under the guise of patent reform to address particular problems, at some point the solution is more toxic than, than the problem, and you have to define the problem, I think, in a very disciplined way. I mean, my, my view on this, all of the topics that we've heard today and, and the one we're addressing here, is that there's three or four principles that I think we need to think about in addressing the problem, and I haven't heard a lot of it today. Uh, the first is caution. The caution because the patent system's important, we shouldn't be screwing around with it willy-nilly. 
for political reasons. There are certainly actors who are uh, motivated not to f from a policy point of view, but trying out of naked self-interest to improve their position in patent litigations, and I don't blame them for that. I, I don't think it ought to be cloaked under the guise of doing the Lord's will, but, but that's what they're doing, and, and we should call that what it is, but we should exercise caution in the process. A second principle that we ought to exercise is discipline. Uh, I very much like Judge Dyke's comment of doing regulation by anecdote. Uh, that's not what we should be doing, but we, we keep hearing about this actor or that actor who sent out X thousand letters. Well, all right, but we don't write policy based on one guy who writes 13,000 letters. Uh, and by discipline, I mean we ought to be defining in a precise and, and really serious way what the problem is and then tailoring the solution to that problem that's been defined in a disciplined way, not just by a story here and a story there. And what we're hearing is a bunch of anecdotes that have been bandied about, and the idea that we ought to be doing policy based on that just seems wrong. And, and you know, I think the idea that we can, we really ought to be, I haven't heard yet a, a disciplined study of exactly what percentage of U.S. patent litigation is high volume, low quality, low value, where it's the Driftnet Fishers who are just trying to settle actual litigation, not demand letters, actual litigation for well below cost of defense. I haven't heard that uh, any decent analysis of what that number is. If it's 1%, 2%, 5%, 10%, 20%, 20%, the answer to that question affects how willing we should be to, to monkey with the patent system to do that. The, the third issue I think that we ought to be thinking about is balance. Uh, and there's been a lot of focus on trolls, again, to my mind, without a disciplined analysis of how large that problem really is. But you know, the problem, the patent system is important in balance. And when it gets out of balance, it's dangerous. And what we have here, in my view, is a persistent and somewhat effective campaign by parties that really don't want a patent system at all. Uh, because they don't benefit from it and don't need it. And a lot of those are large software companies that have never used it. Uh, they'll use it offensively if they can, but that's not what drives their businesses. Well, there's a lot of businesses that are driven by that, and the whole patent system ought not to be driven by their particular desires. The fourth question, and I just throw this out, is whether this is a problem best solved by courts or by the legislature. I mean, the idea that you would have a bunch of largely ignorant, largely politically motivated people deciding patent policy, what could go wrong? Uh, the, the AIA told us that we have a lot of unintended consequences from doing patent litigation by legislation, and I think that we should consider carefully, and I think our panel is, is quite a good example of that, we should consider carefully whether the courts are much better suited to be addressing the questions that we're talking about on a case-by-case -case basis, because yes, of course there are bad actors on both sides of the V. You don't, you don't drive patent policy by two or three bad actors, or 10 or 20. Uh, if there's a really systemic problem, okay, that's one thing, but let's define that systemic problem. Uh, and maybe if it's bad actor here and bad actor there, judges are pretty good at sussing that out, and I think we ought to let them do it. Okay, so maybe we can call these the, um, the powers principles. Caution, discipline, balance, and courts versus legislation. Uh, Ed, Daryl, and Brian, do, do any of you have a response or have a, have a different point of view uh, on the general topic? Yeah, I mean, I could re respond to that and also, you know, respond to your initial framing of the, of the issue, which I thought was a good one. Uh, you know, are there abuses in the system? I think there's always going to be any litigation system, abuses of excess discovery, or excess claims, or prior art. Uh, the system deals with that with model orders and things like that, and, and that sort of incremental stuff that I think can be handled. I think, you know, the, the grotesque problem that we have now, from my perspective, that cries out for a legislative address is, uh, is the situation that Matt identified and, and, and challenged how quantifiable it is, and we could talk about quantifiability, but that is the uh, nuisance settlement uh, business model that's been adopted. Um, I, I don't think there's, to my mind, there's not very many other problems that I consider to be worthy of a legislative uh, focus other than um, that. Now, now, let me just 
um, say anecdotally, I experience that quite a lot. There's many, many cases we have where the approach being taken by the plaintiff is pay us 100,000, pay us 200,000, pay us 50,000, whatever it is, which is less than cost of defense by any, any, any measure. Um, I wrote a paper with Colleen Chen, which attempts to, it doesn't go through and exhaustively analyze the extent of the problem, but I think people that are involved in the field know that this is a substantial issue. I think the issue is caused by three things. Um, the, the kind of things that would fix or address this nuisance settlement value approach, which is, which is I think, offensive and is really, well, let me just step back. I think the political waves that Matt's talking about that we see reflected in congressional reaction and polit polit political reaction is it's now hitting Main Street because smaller entities are being attacked as the number of defendants are being multiplied to um, best monetize this uh, nuisance settlement approach. Um, so that's why we see the political uprising. So I think that itself is one indication of the extent of the problem. I think the, the cause of the problem is, is uh, in my mind, is, is, is relates to three things. One is that judges uh, on fees, the, the, the real best solution is fees, because that way if someone's accusing you with an extremely weak patent of infringement, you have something to say. If they say, look, it's going to cost you $50,000 even to look at this, give me $50,000, that's a tough proposition for someone um, with a fiduciary duty or otherwise to not engage in. Uh, if you said, well, that's a game of chicken because if you lose, I'm going to get all my money back and you're going to have to pay for it, that would balance the playing field. So it's sort of, that's the most proportionate response, I think. Problem is district court judges hate fee disputes because if they've given you the win, from their busy perspective, if they've given you the win, they've zeroed out the plaintiff, they, well, the plaintiff's a loser because it got nothing neglecting the fact that oft times they've gotten millions and millions of dollars from all the people that did settle. But just hold that aside. You've won. They get nothing. You are being a pig for wanting to have your fees paid. And I'm not going to spend my valuable time when I have all these live disputes, patent and otherwise, adjudicating the satellite litigation. So there's an institutional bias at the district court level against fees which I think may counsel for a, an easier standard just to try to encourage it to happen more often. The second thing is customer suit doctrine, which we had a whole panel about, and I don't think we need too much more on that. But I would say that that's another one where for some reason, and I could, could talk a little bit about why, but district court judges really don't, aren't aggressive about applying that doctrine. Um, often it's fuzzy whether there's really a customer. It's fuzzy whether it's an off-the-shelf product and then judges seem to default uh, against the stay in that situation. Um, so that's another institutional bias at the district court level that I think uh, makes judges not the best, not the sole source of a solution to the rather large nuisance settlement value problem that we have. And then the third thing, which is lesser, is pleadings. Um, if, if there was more fleshed out pleadings as to who the real source of the technology is and what the theory of the claim is, <clears throat> You'd have indemnity solutions that are better. You'd have better DJs by in manufacturers coming in earlier. You'd have the real party in interest able to choose counsel. There's a lot of better things that would happen. That's not so much an institutional problem at the judicial level. It's just that the courts' of hands have been tied by uh, Form 18, which is just uh, an artifact of the way the world's evolved. So they can't really do it because of McZeal and the Federal Circuit um, authority that's implemented uh, Rule 84 of the Federal Rules and, and Form 18. I have a feeling on this panel my smart move might be to duck and cover. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, I, I agree with what um, Ed said, um, but I have a slightly different perspective on one thing. Um, I think fee shifting sounds like a great idea. I think as a practical matter, we are always going to meet with that institutional resistance to impose fees, partly because of satellite litigation concerns, but also partly because it does feel punitive relative to the lawyers. We exist in a community, um, and I think judges are understandably reluctant to um, sanction lawyers, and I think this will feel as a practical matter like sanctioning lawyers um, who appear regularly in cases before them. Um, to me, the biggest problem with the cases um, that are resulting in sort of extortive cost of defense settlements is that there is no mechanism to get to a merits adjudication for a price tag 
that renders the litigation itself palatable. That is the thing that strikes me as the most fundamental problem. And I actually do think that reform of the pleading standards, not with respect to who is the real party in interest, but with respect to what the allegations of infringement actually are, is the path that is most likely to lead to meaningful reform. If the pleading had to actually lay out the theory of infringement in a way that was testable by way of a motion to dismiss, um, and if there were procedures for much earlier streamlined adjudication of critical issues, I think that's the thing that's most likely to redress the problem um, rather than fee shifting. You know, in my experience in these troll cases, a very large percentage of the time, you know, you know at the point where you're pitching for the case what the answer is and how it's going to, how the case ought to resolve. You've identified what the one or two key prior art references are going to be. You know what the infringement question is going to be. Um, to me, the most valuable reform would be a way to tee that issue up, and I would trade quality of decision making um, and sort of the fulsomeness of the evidentiary record that goes into that decision making process for an answer with a price tag that my clients could afford. So I wanted to object to the idea that we should uh, maybe be cautious. Right? It, it seems like every, maybe every day lately you can see some op-ed saying right, there's no data that there's a problem, it's just anecdotal issues, and I just want to know what universe these people are living in who are saying these things, right? Uh, we have Mike Moirer here, he's written papers with Jim Besson, Mark Limley's here, Robin Feldman is here, I'm here, Colleen Chin is here, there are studies and studies and studies and studies, right? We can debate about whether it's 40% of suits that are by PAEs are 50 or 60, but regardless of whether it's 40 or 60, 40 is too much, right? And we do know from study after study that the vast majority of these cases filed by NPEs or PAEs, whatever you'd like to call them, they overwhelmingly settle. And when they don't settle, the PAEs overwhelmingly lose, something like 80 to 90% of the time. You put that together, I think that is pretty strong evidence of widespread nuisance value litigation. So my question to Matt would be, what else do you want to know? Well, I think that it comes down to a definition of, of what is the definition of litigation abuse. Uh, and it can't be that it's brought by an NPE or a PAE. So the 40% or 50% or 60% number doesn't really matter. To me, it's a question of the quality of the claim and the approach to litigation. I, I agree with Ed that the people out there who are drift net fishing for 50 or $100,000 a pop, there's not much you can do about that because for exactly the reasons that Daryl and gave, but I'm not sure that's I haven't seen anything that identifies that subset of abuse as being significant. Uh, maybe it is. I mean, there's, there's anecdotal evidence from different people saying that's a meaningful part of their docket. Uh, and I can't deny their uh, experiences, but I don't know that that's the way we ought to be deciding policy. The fact that an NPE or a PAE is bringing the case doesn't mean it's a bad quality case. The fact that they lose doesn't mean it was a bad quality case. Uh, and it, the fact that they lose doesn't mean it's a case on which we should be doing fee shifting. So the issue, people lose cases all the time on either both plaintiffs and defendants where the issues in debate were seriously joined, seriously in doubt, and one side wins. Uh, I don't think any of the proposals I've seen would say that you're going to fee shift just because someone happens to lose. The issue is, is it abusive? Uh, and you know, there's, there's a whole separate debate about w whether PAE or NPE litigation is by itself abusive and ought to be stopped in other ways. I'm not wading into that here. I think that's been done already in, in previous panels. But here we're talking about abusive litigation. and. Uh, I haven't seen a single study, and I've, I'm pretty current in literature, if there's something I've missed, I'd love to see it, that really says, here's the number of high volume, low quality, low value cases that have been filed, and that constitutes X percent of the litigation out there. And then I'd want to know how they assess value, how they assess quality, uh, and we'll see, because there's a lot of numbers being published by a lot of people, some of whom have agendas, 
And when you get below the, the top level headline, a lot of the numbers turn out to be fairly squishy. Well, Matt, I disagree. I think that um, the question isn't whether or not PAEs can bring suit. I think what this panel is addressing is really a question of a number of procedural reforms to lower the cost and tighten the litigation, focus it on the claims at issue. And I think that those are widely beneficial reforms, particularly some of them, and my favorite is the discovery reform. Um, and so I don't think it's really a question of cutting out PAEs from the table. Uh, however, I do agree with you that these are procedural reforms to a substantive problem, and that we do have to look deeper for answers. I was going to say, so what Matt said sounds very reasonable, right? We need more data on the, on the extent to which there are really these nuisance value settlements. The problem is we're not going to have that data unless we prohibit confidentiality provisions and settlement agreements that keep those numbers largely hidden from view. I think Ed and I could both tell you, as a matter of our own practices and our experience with our clients, that there are a ton of cases out there that are settling for $40,000, $50,000, $90,000. And indeed, there are companies um, who are confronting large volumes of cases where that is the majority of the cases that are being brought against them. But most of those settlements have confidentiality provisions, and so it's not at all clear to me how you, that you would be able to get access to the data to actually do the kind of study that you're asking for. And I would add to that, I mean, it seems to me that if we have representatives of um, companies that are saying that this is the majority of their cases are those style, that that's not the precise quantification that's being requested. But at some point, if enough people are saying that, that are credible people, sometimes under oath at FTC proceedings or whatever, and then you have people like Darlin and I who both do both sides. I mean, half my docket is plaintiff, still is. Uh, mostly in life sciences, not over in the EE side. Maybe we're making it up, but I, I, I just think that it's widespread enough to really suggest uh, that there's no significant problem with nuisance settlement business models is not realistic. I think when we see in the docket sheets people suing 20 or 30 trucking companies or cat food vendors or whatever it is, it doesn't matter. You know what's happening. I mean, maybe not every time, and maybe I can't put a percentage on that. I mean, to me, it seems that it, I, I'm very interested in balance. I, my positions are never, not on one side of the docket or the other. It, it, de denying that there's a substantial issue to be addressed with nuisance settlement business model for patent entities doesn't seem like a good use of energy. Uh, maybe more precision on that is something that, that would be worthwhile for the Academy, and we've got great people here, and maybe uh, I, I hear what Darylin says, but there's also some of that that leaks out, or there's a lot more production of licenses um, since the Federal Circuit has, you know, kind of made that more of a discoverable thing. I mean, before it was discoverable, it was no hope. Now maybe we could do more work on that. I think what really we need to do the hard work of figuring out how do we do something proportionate so that we really target to me, this stubborn little problem, when I say little, little in the spectrum of patent issues, big in the spectrum of the degree of abuse, that we're not having collateral damage because I agree with all the other principles Matt says. The fact that the entity is not practicing like Stanford University, who I represent in a plaintiff's case, um, it, it, it's not the entity. And for, I'm not even complaining about you know asymmetric discovery and some of the other things people complain about. What I think is really, like I said before, I used a, a hot button term, grotesque, is what happens. I, I, had a, I have a case here, people get a yuck out of this, a, a very small company, unusually small for, for me to be representing, that we got a, a, the other side approached us to settle the case for a bet on a transfer motion. If we win the transfer motion at ED Tax, we get a walk away. If we lose, it's 100000 and that's because we haven't been willing to sort of give them some amount of money, you know? And that's highly anecdotal, but, you know, I just think it's a real problem. But we do need to make sure that that doesn't prevent some of the kind of companies that Matt works with that have real patent portfolios being asserted against real companies somehow having a gear in the, in, in, a, a wrench in the gears so that he can't be pursuing that case in a, in a stand-up way that he's, he's more than capable of doing. Ed, you can't uh, leave us hanging like that. Who won the bet? It's, it's, no, I, I, you know, 
saying this in front of a lot of people. Uh, <laughs> maybe I've gone too far already. I'm not comfortable doing it because I'm not comfortable if I was ever asked by the judge what we were doing because it entails asking for a stay pending disposition of the transfer motion. I'm afraid we'll get called in to say, why do you want to do that? And I wouldn't want to have to say we're betting on your transfer disposition. <laughs> That's where I'm currently <laughs> leaning. Okay, well, why don't we uh, shift gears a little bit. A number of you have um, raised the issue of uh, fees and potential fee shifting of one sort or another as uh, a, one possible tool uh, at our disposal. Uh, Brian, do you want to talk about the pending legislation, the Innovation Act, the Patent uh, yeah, sure, Transparency sure. Act, and, and also if you could work in uh, what's pending before the Supreme Court and if you think that these acts, th these statutes are even necessary in light of what may come out by June. Right, so uh, the background to this discussion is essentially the fact that right, even though Section 285 exists, it gives courts the power to award a fees for exceptional cases, right? Courts rarely do that, right? So if you look at the empirical studies, let's say roughly over the last decade, uh, something like less than 2% of cases in which there was a ruling on the merits was there a fee award. And if you look at the amounts that were awarded in these cases, right, these, the sort of the median fee award to an accused infringer is something like $110,000 even though we know from the AIPLA survey that even for the relatively small size cases, the cost of defense are generally 600,000, 650,000, 700,000, right? So rarely used and when it's used, the amounts that are awarded are relatively small, okay? So the question becomes how might this change in the future? And so there's two things that might happen, right? One is patent reform legislation being passed. Uh, for example, the Goodlatte uh, Innovation Act that was passed in uh, the House in December would rewrite 285, so it says the court shall award to a prevailing party reasonable fees and other expenses unless the court finds that the position of the non-prevailing party or parties was reasonably justified, right? So two big changes there. One is making a presumption in favor of fee shifting. The other is changing from an exceptional case standard to one in which the case is reasonably justified, right? So one big question there is what does reasonably justified mean and does that actually move the needle in the direction of awarding fees uh, in more cases, that might be something that we can discuss if folks are interested, but there are uh, similar statutes with similar language that have been interpreted in ways that might suggest that wouldn't be the case. The other big question mark, I think, is whether if any patent reform is passed, will it include fee shifting, right? The Leahy bill in the Senate does not include a fee shifting provision. So then in addition to the legislation, we have the Supreme Court taking up a pair of cases, Highmark and Octane, Octane being the one of the two that actually deals with the standard for awarding fees. Uh, obviously, uh, so the cases were argued last month. Um, let's see, so obviously Octane wants the standard to be lowered from sort of the objectively baseless standard to something else. And my understanding of the oral argument is that it mostly devolved into a theoretical discussion of various nouns and adjectives that would have uh, some relationship to this issue. So the court threw out things like meritless, objectively meritless, without substantial merit, low likelihood of success, unreasonable, unreasonably weak, a little bit lower than the Rule 11 standard, and something more than frivolous, right? These were all things that were mentioned at the oral argument. And then eventually, I think Justice Scalia got Octane's counsel to agree that what it really wanted was a totality of the circumstances test, which is what the Solicitor General, the Solicitor General argued for uh, in its brief. Um, so I think uh, just from a, uh, an, an objective perspective, I think that's where we are today. Now, Brian, I know this is an area of some research for you. Setting aside your objectivity, what, what's your view on whether any of these measures is either necessary or whether you expect them to have any effect? Right, so, uh, so I'm not sure I'm 100% in favor of sort of European-style mandatory fee shifting. But I did do some empirical research into patent litigation in the UK that at least I think at least sheds a little bit of light 
into this, right? So the UK is probably the European country that's the closest to the US in that they have the highest damages awards and the most expensive litigation, okay? So if you look at the UK where they have mandatory two-way fee shifting, you see that only about 11 percent of patent cases are filed by NPEs in the UK dating back to about the year 2000, okay? Uh, compared to, you know, a much larger amount here in the intervening time, right? So why the low rate? So a couple of things. One is that if you look at NPE cases in the UK, two things, they overwhelmingly don't settle. Less than 50 percent of NPE cases in the UK do not settle. And as they do in the US, NPs overwhelmingly lose in the UK. So you put those two things together, you wind up with a scenario where NPEs wind up paying the accused infringers more often than they receive money uh, in return. So it sort of seems like being an NPE is the expected value of doing that is negative in the UK because there's a fee shifting scenario which encourages firms to fight and to win uh, and then to win their fees back. And, and in fact, if you look at the data, right, there's not a whole lot of data to go on, but if you look at it, you can kind of see a scenario where it looks like NPEs test out the market there, they sue, they lose, they pay fees, and they don't sue again. So that, I think, suggests, right, there's lots of confounding variables there, admittedly, but I think that suggests that it would be useful in the U.S. But, but what is it about patents that should be different in the U.S.? I mean, we historically have a system of each side bearing their own fees, and, and it's part of the American access to justice approach. Why should we single out the patent system for differential treatment? And that's not just to Brian, it's any, anybody, on the, anybody on the panel. I, I'm happy to take that. I mean, one is, you know, speaking of the asymmetric symmetric. I mean, we clearly allow fees to be recovered by the party pursuing it. Uh, you know, and I haven't done, and I don't have the, the pedigree that many of the professors here do to have done the kind of historical study, but my understanding from practice is that intellectual property law has a long history of fee shifting um, in copyright and trademark and patent. They all have the, the, the idea that in order to avoid abuse one way or the other, because it's such a whatever it is, I guess it's such a commercial dispute that there's a need. Um, so I think no one's really, I mean, no one's suggesting 285 should be eliminated. We should purely rely on Rule 11. And, you know, Judge Dyke referenced Rule 11 as being sort of common throughout all law. Well, that's true, but 285 exists. And like I said, I don't think anyone's really cha really challenging that. The point I would make is, um, you know, again, anecdotally, in the Raylon case, um, you know, the, the argument was made, it was, it, it, it was basically, you had to have uh, a, ha a housing to a screen that was pivotably, you know, pivotally rotatable or something like that. And the argument by the plaintiff in that case was that a screen like this would be pivotally rotatable because you could move it with your elbows and wrists and hands, right? And it was obviously a mechanical patent, and if you look at the claim language, you'll see that makes no real sense. Well, the judge there didn't give fees. <laughs> The judge there said, no, that, you know, well, it's sort of at the edge, it's sketchy, yeah, that's really strained, but I'm not going to give you fees on that. So the point that I was making, and I really, and, and I think Daryl and I gave different reasons why district judges are resistant to 285 motions, I think all of them are true. <laughs> I think it's, it's all of those reasons and more probably why they don't like it's the satellite, it's the uh, bad thing. So I, I, I think you know, without going into why is this different and just trying to solve the obvious problem that's present is that there's a need to lower the standards so judges don't feel like they're labeling people, you know, heinous bad people. They're just saying to argue that every screen is a pivot, a pivot the housing is pivotally rotatable, you know, we need that kind of, that should be like beyond the line because the problem is, and this is the ugly underbelly that Daryl and I live and, and some of the corporate representatives here live, is of the cases that get that far, there's 10 where a bunch of people are paying $50,000 to someone who's collecting two, $3 million off a patent because this is supposedly pivotally housed. I mean, and, and that's conservative. Question, um, Michael?
work with the Copyright Act, it just says that a court may have discretion to award a reasonable attorney's fee. Okay, it doesn't have to be an exceptional case status. It just seems to me that would give district court a lot more. That's one, so, one solution. I think the did, I, I, I'm sorry. I actually, did it, could everybody hear the question? Yeah, that's okay. Um, so, so the question was, is one potential fix for this issue simply conforming the patent statute's fee provision and the Copyright Act's fee provision, basically eliminating the adjective exceptional from the patent statute? And the, 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 point, the point is, I think we get at least halfway there if you don't have to prove subjective bad faith. And that's sort of been one of the big problems, is you don't, you're not going to find a, a smoking gun and someone has to be labeled subject of bad faith. I don't really care what your faith is. If you want $50,000 for this is, a, you know, this is rotatable, the answer should be that's so, such a lame argument just to keep the system in balance, we're not letting that happen. You know, in terms of the different linguistic formulations, I guess, I, I mean, if I just had to pick one out of a hat, it would be unreasonable if it's an unreasonable claim. But that's sort of like what you're saying, discretion. So I think there's a lot to what you're saying. First thing, we need to get rid of this subject of bad faith. Any other? Oh, I just wanted to make two please. comments about that. First, in my opinion, if you give the courts discretion, if you make it discretionary, inevitably one district or another is going to become known for not awarding fees. And you're going to encourage, continue to encourage forum shopping. And the um, plaintiffs have made a lot of uh, changes to the way they litigate and set up shop to, to, to make uh, transferring venue tougher, notwithstanding that what the Federal Circuit has done. And, and I think uh, Judge Rader has gone on the record uh, saying that they're not going to take any more writs on transfer. So uh, even though most of our cases are in Delaware, uh, we still get sued in the Eastern <laughs> of Texas. And uh, so I think that this, it's, a, it's a response to the discretion suggestion. The other point I want to make about uh, why patent cases should be treated differently for fee shifting is it's one of, if not the only, class of claims that can be sold. And the, pur the purchaser is in the same position as the buyer as far as the ability to acquire the same amount of damages. Even if you could assign your personal injury case, a jury is not going to award the purchaser the same kind of damages they would uh, award the injured party. But for patent cases, in fact, the, the courts go out of their way to avoid you shedding uh, uh, or, or calling the purchaser, uh, denigrating the purchaser because they bought that claim. You, know, you can't call them a patent troll, this and that. So I think patent uh, claims are particularly unique uh, in that respect. I guess from my perspective, I like your suggestion, and I would, I would be more comfortable with it if we had a type of a judicial construction which carved out fees for small entities or micro entities that are practicing the patent at issue. Uh, because I do think, I'm mindful of what uh, Robin Feldman said this morning, that it's sort of infused in the statutory language, but I'm also mindful of Peter Detkin's statement that he was hoping that we would do fee shifting so he could buy up lots more patents. And so I would be more comfortable with a carve out. And along those lines, I should add that in the UK, on a per patent basis, there's about 20% as much litigation as there is in the US. So it would suggest that fee shifting lowers all patent litigation, right? In addition to disproportionately affecting NPEs. Go ahead, Matt. So I find this issue interesting, and I think the, the concept of balance that I introduced earlier is relevant to this one, too. All of the comments that have been made so far have been directed to the filing of lawsuits that people think should not have been filed. Uh, and no one disputes that there are certainly many examples of those that, that we can all agree shouldn't have been filed. But there are at least an equal number and probably a much greater number of defenses that shouldn't be asserted where defendants drive up the cost of their own litigation about which they're now complaining, in part per perhaps because some lawyers are motivated by how they're compensated, in part because perhaps a large defendant wishes to increase the cost of litigation for a smaller plaintiff. And all of that needs to be considered when we're talking about this question. And so when we're talking about fee shifting, there's an interesting question about how granular you, do you get. So let's say a plaintiff loses, uh, but the defendant drove up the cost of litigation unreasonably by 3x. Who pays who net in that process? Uh, maybe the plaintiff should be paid net fees because it was forced to litigate issues that didn't win, that shouldn't have been brought. Uh, that happens. It happens. I, 
could give you a lot of anecdotal uh, comments about that, and a lot of, if you had more plaintiff's lawyers up here, they could give you anecdotal comments about that as well. And, you know, I, so I think that what's missing from this discussion is a balanced question about where all of the excess cost and litigation is and where does it come from, and how do we get at it? I mean, for Michael's question, it's interesting, but you, you can't just say discretion. You have to give some information about how that discretion ought to be exercised. And And if, if, if the standard comes down to whether someone asserted something that was objectively baseless, let's start there, uh, I think some people would say, well, that's too, low a, that's too high a test. Well, you could argue whether that's the right test. Is it one that just lost? I think most people would agree that's too low a test. Uh, then you're into the 27 synonyms. Uh, from the Supreme Court argument, all of which are fuzzy, all of which are going to lead, are essentially the same as the 285 test, uh, and analytically, I think, indistinguishable. Uh, and so, it, to me, I have a hard time seeing where this debate goes. I mean, on, on one hand, I find it intriguing because as a plaintiff's lawyer, I turn down 99% of the cases that come to me based on quality reasons. There's not a defense lawyer in the room who's turned down a case from an institutional client for quality reasons when it comes in the door. And so then you ask yourself in the abstract, how many cases are gonna be objectively baseless where the case is baseless versus the defense is being perhaps baseless? Well, that's, you know, that's an interesting question because you have a stronger filter coming in on the front end on the plaintiff's side than you do the defense side. And it may be that defendants end up paying plaintiffs more under this test than, than plaintiffs paying defendants. So I think one of the things that fee shifting creates, it's such a radical shift from way, the way that we've thought about litigation generally in the US. And it's one of those things that I talked about earlier. There's the law of unintended consequences is extreme. And this is one that seems like it's gonna have a greater potential for that than most. So, I mean, I, I agree, and I, I suspect everyone agrees in equal treatment and, and, and not putting a thumb on the scale, and I do for business, mo my own personal business model is among other reasons, but uh, and just it's the right thing. But I, I, I would look at it differently than that, which is there's a difference between excess claims and then having no legitimate position in general. Uh, I think if you were going to count up who brings more claims or positions that aren't pursued, it's gonna be plaintiffs over defendants every time, uh, depending on how you calculate it, because you always get 30, 40, 60, 100 claims that are being asserted, and then that goes down to two or four or six. On the prior art side, Matt's exactly right, that happens on the prior art side too. I think looking at it as who brought excess stuff that fell away during the course of the case, Matt's exactly right, that's a morass that maybe in extreme cases is worth pursuing, is worth pursuing. Um, I was on the wrong side of, in that O2 micro case, I was the appellate lawyer um, where I lost on a $10 million sanction against our client um, for sort of a parade of horrible such as, as those kind of arguments. So I get that, um, but the real question isn't that. That's not what we're really talking about, at least what I heard. The argument that we have is that, in general, the position has no objective basis, and people are using it to monetize by getting well below cost of defense. To me, if you're looking at it for balance and symmetry, that's the case where there's willfulness, and for willfulness, you get an increase in damages. That's, the, the, that's to me, it's whether the overall claim, was there overall a defense, was there overall a claim, and that's, you know, I'm sure there's well more people that have received um, premiums, whether it be in fees or, or increases, on the plaintiff side than the defense side. So if you're looking at a symmetry, that's equal. To me, it's confounding the question if you start getting into, well, defendants bring extra defenses. And then the other thing I'd like to address is motives. Because there's a suggestion that when uh, law firms bring a lot of prior art, def um, you know, in these charts that you have to put together, that they're doing it for self-interested economic reasons. And actually, you know, having worked in the area of, of rules extensively, I've become convinced that that's not so in general. You, again, you have your outliers. 
I think what it is, and, and sort of insightful, and this goes to the model order topic that we're going to be, that we're to be talking about as well, is it's really defensive lawyering. It's that no one wants to, if you have an unlimited amount of prior art that you can chart, you're going to, want, you're going to say to your team, and Daryl Lynn's probably going to say to her team, not with her really small clients, but when, when she's funded sufficiently and enough's at stake, go get me everything, all the relevant prior art, let's chart it. Who knows where this case is going to go? We really don't even know what the plaintiff's ultimate theory of the case is going to be. We really don't know what the claim construction or the storyline is going to be later. Let's keep all of the everything in play until we ha are forced to make the choice. And God forbid we make our own cutoff with prior art, and then everyone says, how come you didn't include it? There was no problem. But if you have a limit of, let's say, 20 or 30 prior art references, just, again, exemplary, and, and, and that, Daryl and I would look at our teams and say, all right, give me the 20 best. And someone would say, of course, there would be someone that loves the 21st reference and says, oh, we, you know, it's the end of the world. We say, oh, no, we've got to make a choice. We're, we're only allowed 20. And then we go to the client. We say, hey, there's this issue 2021. And then later, if 21 becomes the key to life, because the case swerves and swoops to like we all, anyone that's in the courtroom knows, we say, look, we did our best. Remember, we raised you 21. We only had 20. We picked 20 good ones. 21 wasn't work. And the law firm doesn't have egg on its face. The long story of that is that limits, enforceable limits through, um, whether it's model orders or, or rules or whatever it is, is a very effective way to uh, address those kind of excesses because I think people are acting in, with, with good intent, but it prevents the need to be defensive. Same on the plaintiff side. If you're being told you have to pick your five best claims, if it turns out that the pendant claim you needed you wasn't in there, there's an explanation both to the court and your client why you did what you did. I don't think it's people padding their pockets because I think in the long run, anyone sophisticated knows that you don't keep clients that way, you don't build a reputation that way. Um, so excess claims and defenses can be addressed, I think, through those kind of everyday vehicles. But the problem of unreasonable claims being used for nuisance settlements uh, remains and needs to be addressed. I, I know we could talk about fee shifting uh, much longer, but just in the interest of, of time, um, why don't we move on to a couple of other topics that are currently under consideration in Congress. Um, someone had mentioned raised pleading standards. M Matt, do you want to just provide a, a brief intro into the pleading standards that are under consideration and, and then feel free to speak about your view as to whether they're necessary and will be effective? Sure. The, the, there's a variety of forms, but basically the concept is that in the complaint, one would have to give the level of detail that currently is reserved for detailed infringement contentions that are required by many districts around the country. And the theory, I guess, is that for those people who really have no theory of infringement that's viable and are just throwing something out there and hoping to get the, the, the interim effect of the uh, of the fact of the lawsuit pending, that that will discourage them because A, they're going to have to do more work for the complaint, and B, if there's obvious glaring gaps in the contentions, then uh, that's something that could be tested earlier in the case by a more efficient mechanism. Uh, I, I guess I have two thoughts on this. One is, you know, conceptually it doesn't really bother me at all. The lack of balance bothers me a bit, but uh, any plaintiff's lawyer worth his or her salt is doing that analysis before they file the case anyway. And if somebody can't answer those questions within the confines of particular cases, because obviously the, the problem you have is that many cases are in the code and you don't have the code and you, you can't just have a rule that basically doesn't allow you to bring a claim that could be good, but you don't know how good it is and how specific it is until you look at the other side source code, then you, you can't establish a rule that blocks those cases. But in general, I, I don't, it doesn't bother me because I think, as I say, anybody worth, worth what they're doing is, already does that. There is a lack of symmetry here. Uh, I also don't think it's going to accomplish much. Uh, if you look at the districts where you have detailed infringement contentions, they're often required quite soon after the complaint. You don't have those cases going away based on those infringement contentions. So I don't, I don't really think it's going to accomplish much at all. What I, what I do think, you know, it's just another example of the lack of balance. I mean, 
you could impose the same obligation with regard to invalidity contentions that the typical answer filed by a defendant says it's invalid under section 101, 102, 103, 112, and anything else. And the usual argument is made against that is, aha, the plaintiff has much more time to prepare their contentions before, before they file suit. We've only got, with extensions and everything else, maybe two months. And it's not fair to make us give detailed invalidity contentions in two months. Well, uh, I don't know. I, I, most of the good lawyers I know have detailed invalidity contentions in their mind already within two months. Uh, someone earlier commented that by the time you're doing the pitch, you already know the two or three best pieces of prior art. I think that's probably true, too. And so if you're, gonna, if you're going to require everybody to give very detailed allegations at the front end of defining what they know the issues to be, I think if it's mutual and if you give appropriate opportunities to amend those contentions as the parties learn more, because the plaintiff's going to learn more that will require it to amend and the defendant will learn more that will require it to amend, then I see no reason not to impose the same obligation both ways. Daryl, and how, if at all, does that square with your comment earlier that uh, tightened pleading standards might allow for potentially earlier resolution of, of, of cases that lack merit? Yeah, I agree with Matt's comment that it ought to be bilateral. I don't see any reason that you shouldn't be required to give equal specificity in an answer and affirmative defenses and be subject to a motion to strike if you don't. Um, but it seems to me that if you require the plaintiff to set forth their infringement theory in their complaint, that is meaningfully different from simply requiring early infringement contentions because it is a document where there is a more well-recognized mechanism for testing its sufficiency. I mean, the problem with infringement contentions, you make a motion and you say, these, you know, these infringement contentions aren't good enough, please, you know, make them better. You know, most judges are going to look at you, it's a really thick document, it's confusing, it's complicated. Um, there's a whole bunch of evidence cited in there, and they're going to say, well, they kind of look like infringement contentions to me. Um, I mean, maybe you'll get a, a more detailed response, but I'm sympathetic to that judicial response. It's a discovery dispute. Judges hate discovery disputes. I don't see that as being an effective mechanism. But if you require in a complaint a detailed recitation of what the infringement theory is, and I'm focused less, obviously, on the sufficiency of the evidence, but what the infringement theory is, that actually presents what ought to be, in many cases, a legal question about whether that infringement theory is sufficient and has a sufficient nexus to the claims of the patent. Now, it may require some claim construction in order to determine whether that is a viable infringement theory. Um, but in some instances, it may not, or the claim construction issue may be one that can be resolved readily as a matter of law without the need for the resort to any extrinsic evidence or anything that would be outside the four corners of the complaint and the patent that is attached to it. Um, and if that could be made into a sort of a useful mechanism for presenting to a judge at the outset of the case what the actual merits issue is likely to be, that strikes me as something that would be enormously helpful. I think that's theoretically true. I think in practice it won't happen because anybody who does the infringement contentions in a, in a decent way is going to do it in such that you're asking the judge effectively to skip the entire Markman process uh, truncate all of that via a motion to dismiss. And, and I think well written and you know, it's not hard to write them well, even if ultimately they don't prevail. Well written infringement contentions aren't going to get dismissed on a 12B motion. You know, it's not hard for you to write them well, but I mean, I think, I think the disjunct is, you know, you live in a, rare, in a much more rarefied world. Um, you know, there's no, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have any doubt that your complaints are not going to get dismissed on a 12B6 motion. Um, but the people who are trying to get the $50,000 settlements, if they actually have to write a complaint that's going to survive a 12B6 and survive some level of judicial scrutiny, um, I actually think that sort of eats up a lot of that $50,000. And I think if you're on the defense side, if there really isn't a colorable infringement theory, it gives you something to shoot at. Now, I agree it would require... Uh, you know, sort of a little bit of reorientation about how some judges think about 12B6 motions, and I'm not sort of Pollyannish in thinking that this is going to be sort of a, you know, a, a, an immediate solution. But I, I think the same thing is true with 101 motions. I mean, I, you know, if, if, if that were something that could be tested on the face of the patent at the motion to dismiss stage, 
same thing. You're going to get rid of a bunch of cases with a price tag that, you know, makes it realistic not to pay the $50,000, but to say, hey, we're actually going to fight this because we're right. Um, I, I think Matt's being too tough on the, uh, on the, on the, on the complaint drafter. Um, I, I don't think it makes any sense to require infringement contentions in the complaint. I have a number of objections to that. One is, especially in these cases where 50 claims are being presented, the idea that you're going to 50 claim charts in a complaint just on its face seems uh, not implausible. The idea that you're going to put confidential information in there seems implausible. There's times when you need information, as Matt pointed out, code or other things, that creates complication. Um, I don't like the idea. I think, you know, and I guess disclaimer, I'm, you know, sir, I long served and sort of associated with the patent rules and in terms of the, the, the committee here in Northern District of California and we have a working system that works. We have spent a lot of energy on when you can amend and when you can't amend, which is a lot tighter than the liberal Rule 15 standard. I mean, we've got a working system and to have the complaint come in and grab in to the infringement contentions process. Um, I mean, Darlin's ideas are clever. I mean, that, to me, that's almost like early case, judicial case management would be good. You don't need to do it through saying what's in the complaint. You just need early, early case management. So I disagree with any idea that, that you have to put infringement cont contention style things in a complaint for those reasons. And if I spent more time, I could come up with more. What I do think is that, uh, and it's sort of like half of the proposal is good and half is too much. Um, I do think that the current state of affairs with, with Form 18 is ridiculous, and you should have to identify the product, you should have to identify claims, um, and you should have to identify the accused functionality that's at issue. And I would add something else, which is uh, not in the legislation at all, but I've, I've suggested multiple times it should be, that the chain of title should have to be in, in the complaint so that just like when you do a, you know, a search for a house title when you buy property, you need to know how you actually have the rights because there's defective complaints. I have two right now active and untold in the history of my career where the plaintiff doesn't actually own all the rights they need to do assert the claims. And maybe I'm just a softy, but the heartbreak to see that people are paying fifty or $100,000 to someone that doesn't even have the perfected rights is ridiculous. And then you get in this debate, which I got an email, I'm working with Sonal on this matter, we got an email early this week where they said, we said, can you show us the documentation because on its face you don't own all the patent rights to assert this complaint. And they said, well, that's appropriate for the discovery process. And this, I mean, that's not right. And that should have to be in the complaint. So there are improvements to the, the, uh, the process, but I think the idea of infringement contentions is, is way overboard. So the, um, the last piece, I think, in terms of uh, current pending legislation is uh, limits on discovery. Daryl, do you want to just provide a, a brief overview? Yeah, one of the proposals that's in, the, in at least one of the current pending um, bills is to limit discovery pre-markment um, to that which is necessary in order for the court to be able to construe the claims. Now, obviously, there are some you know, exceptions for special circumstances. But the basic premise is, you know, set up an early Markman hearing, um, not have extensive discovery in advance of that. I think for those of us who practice primarily on the defense side, at first blush, that sounds like a wonderful idea because obviously discovery is, you know, expensive and you'd like to get to some sort of resolution as quickly as possible. The thing that concerns me about that proposal um, is that it does presuppose that an early Markman, sort of untethered to how the accused device actually works, is going to be a judicially, a sort of a useful event in all cases. And my concern about the proposal, maybe counterintuitively to what I've been saying, is that you're going to wind up in a situation where the courts feel required to conduct these early Markman hearings, but they don't feel that they actually have the information that they need in order to make a decision. And either you're going to wind up with sort of frustrated judges who throw up their hands and say sort of plain meaning in the absence of feeling like they have the ability to come up with something um, more useful, um, uh, you know, or you're going to wind up with claim constructions that sort of substitute one word for another and then you wind up sort of down the road with the meta claim construction problem when the actual infringement issue gets teed up um, and the discovery has been had. So I actually am I'm sort of concerned um, that while it sounds like a great idea, it may not actually be productive. 
I think this is a good example of where the legislature should listen to the courts because when Markman first came down, the whole theory of Markman was you do this early Markman and uh, that would tell you whether there's validity or infringement and you'd get rid of the case early without all the discovery expense. That was explicitly the concept. And as judges tried to do that, they found that A, they didn't have enough information to do an intelligent Markman, and B, when they did an early Markman, they were construing the construction or doing another round of Markman in summary judgment once the context was clear, and that their Markman decisions were poor because they didn't have the information they needed to do it well. And so that is the reason why Markman hearings have gradually crept to be later in the process, not at the very end other than a few districts, but sort of in the middle after you've had enough information to understand the infringement and validity landscape in which that Markman decision is going to be rendered, uh, but still enough time for the parties to react to that in discovery and, and do appropriate discovery in light of the Markman to provide their claims and defenses in light of it. And the idea that we're just going to legislate this and change all of that experience, I think, is nonsense. And the idea that, that why, and, and you know, the, the world works in mysterious ways, and what, we're going to, what this is going to produce is endless debates about what discovery is or is not needed for a Markman. And if the answer is none, then I don't think there's any reasonable debate that the quality of the Markmans will go way down. If the answer is uh, enough but not too much, then I think we are going to be in a, uh, in a Goldilocks situation where we're endlessly debating how much is just right and how much is too much. And judges hate that. Uh, I think the model rules that, that we've all spent a lot of time creating strike a good balance there. Uh, obviously, there's competing considerations on both sides. But the idea that we're just going to legislate against decades of judicial experience, uh, I think, is, is madness. Does anyone else have a, have, have a view, either contrary or otherwise? A Amy? I think Derlin's identified a sort of a weakness in the drafting of the statute, which talks about a stay of discovery, other discovery, non-Markman discovery, until the ruling is issued. And I think unless there is some kind of congressional fix, uh, that's going to be a problem. Um, and then, of course, there's the concept of core discovery, which is limiting discovery unless uh, to particular uh, relevant issues that are common in patent cases, um, which I do think will cut down some of those free-floating and open discovery requests, which I'm in favor of. The other, one of the other legislative proposals that's on the table is uh, cost shifting with respect to um, sort of discovery other than certain well-defined categories. Um, and uh, I'm curious as to the panel's reaction to that. That, I mean, that from my perspective seems much more useful in terms of limiting discovery abuses if you could have a certain set of core discovery that you needed to provide. And then if the other side wants information in addition to that, um, fine, maybe the, maybe the court will deem that appropriate, but they should have to bear at least some portion of the cost for requesting that. Now, obviously, this is the sort of thing where the devil is going to be in the details, and you can imagine, you know, an enormous amount of ancillary litigation over whether the cost figures that are being provided are too high. But it does seem to me that if you had that concept over time, you could develop some protocols around at least payment for things like document hosting costs and and the costs of the outside vendors who are used in connection with the production of discovery, because that cost alone can be quite significant. I, I was going to say, maybe that's a good um, segue, Ed, to, for you to talk a little bit further about some of the existing mechanisms that yeah. we already have to, to address these topics. Yeah, they relate. So let me, let me pull that together, uh, Ashok. I appreciate that. Um, so on the stay of discovery, I guess one thing I want to add to that, again, wearing my kind of my patent rules hat, is I think it's another area where well-intentioned ideas have intruded into working patent rule system. I mean, the addition, and Matt was involved at the outset, you know, with I and others in the in the community. The idea of infringement contentions, invalidity contentions, their very essence was to create a framing of the case and the issues so you'd have crystallized questions for claim construction. The biggest problem you have with with claim construction being done mid-case and not after experts, uh, as the group knows is, if anything, too abstract. 
that you don't have joined up issues and so you have the rolling claim construction or these other problems. You would only exacerbate that if you didn't have a vehicle for those issues to crystallize and the idea that you're gonna intrude in on infringement contentions and inv invalidity contentions in the working patent rules that are throughout the country with a stay is not the way I would do it. Now the idea of core technical discovery which goes into the model order topic, you know, I think maybe has more, more opportunity. Um, Darylin's point about let's have different classes of discovery and then different shifting, uh, again, I think very well intentioned and creative and, and we need these things and we should probably test them in laboratories of particular districts, but a lot of line drawing and, and when you have line drawing and you have fee shifting and you have all that, there's expense and that doesn't mean you abandon them, it just means that you go and open eyes with um, the overhead that you're gonna incur. The model order, I am heartened that, you know, the, under the original auspices of the Federal Circuit Advisory Council and subsequently not so, um, we did the model e-discovery order, which, which is, I think, most people practicing known has kind of revolutionized um, the area and reduced e-discovery at a massive level, and that was more than anyone could have thought. Um, and I think like a lot of things, the, to me the analogy is to the, the 10 deposition rule or the one day deposition. Before those rules came in place in the early 90s, um, people like Matt and me, maybe working together in tag team, would take depositions and we'd take three, four, five days of an inventor and we would get good stuff, especially on that fifth day. Uh, and if anyone that took one day, we'd say, why, you know, what are they doing? And there's sort of a machismo thing almost, um, or even a logic thing, why would people do that? And then all of a sudden the rules changed and created these defaults and guess what? The world did not end, the sky did not fall, the amount of discovery cost went down. And it's the same thing with e-discovery. People say, well, how could you pick the arbitrary number of you know, 10 custodians or five custodians for every case? Each case is different. What about a 10 patent case? What about a five patent case? You could say the th same thing about the de depositions. How could you say 10 depositions for a social security appeal versus a, a massive patent case? The answer is it just moves the needle, which it did fortunately, to get rid of and squeeze a lot of waste out of the system. And now on the deposition side, People will talk and say 60 hours, 70 hours, 80 hours. They don't even use the same language as the, as the rules. But if you didn't have the default, you wouldn't be talking in that neighborhood. And the e-discovery model orders, it's not a form. I, I mean, I don't actually use the form ever. It's just now the conversation is how many custodians. We're talking in the 510 range. Okay, it's a big case. Let's go to 12. And same with terms. So it kind of moved the needle. So some of these things, I think, just create the norms that change the conversation in a helpful way. Matt mentioned the concern that he has on the plaintiff side about seeing so many prior art references. Um, again, there's model orders that have been introduced about limiting the number of claims and prior art references, which I think are healthy. So these are ideas that are out there. Um, some courts have adopted them. Frankly, it's more just creating the norms in the community as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I think this is a situation where the best is the enemy of the good. I mean, you know, I think, I think Ed's point was really important, that as lawyers, we sort of can't help ourselves from wanting to turn over every stone. And, Part of it may be sort of what Ed was referring to as a bit of a self-protective measure relative to somebody later coming back at you and saying, why didn't you find, you know, prior art reference number 37? Uh, but I also just think, you know, you get invested in the thing and you want to win, um, and it's sometimes hard to know, you know, where to draw the line. I thought it was interesting when Brian was talking about the English system and fee shifting because, of course, there's a lot less discovery um, in, the English, in the English system. Um, and that, you know, probably has an impact on what the attorney's fees are that are then getting shifted over to the other side. Also no contingency fee litigation too. So I'm just curious to hear from the, the, the model orders have been around now for at least a little while and have been in practice and have managed to kind of make their way into the, the fabric of, of the patent ecosystem. For those of you who are litigating, those of you who are studying it, have you found them to be, be beneficial as, as Ed has suggested they have been and is there anything that you might tweak or do differently or that you think might be improved upon, not so much to, as Daryl and suggested, to make the good into the best, but simply to provide necessary additional improvement. I think the, the fundamental point that Ed was making is exactly right, and it goes back to the local district rules and everything else, is that if you think about it in very rigid terms, then it doesn't make a lot of sense. If you think about it as establishing sort of a baseline around which you argue from the context of a particular case, then it does make a lot of sense. And I think people are understanding that it's not a rigid discussion and you have 
a sensible discussion around those numbers based on that case. And I think that in that sense it's very positive because before that it was a discussion that wasn't particularly grounded or a discussion that wasn't had at all. Uh, and having the discussion is a, is a positive thing. And I think that uh, it has had a positive impact and will continue to. Okay, um, I, I guess on the, the similar topic, Amy, did you want to speak to maybe the new track B or some of the model orders that, that have been out there that, that have made efforts, similar efforts to try and cabin the scope of discovery? Yeah, so I'm going to talk about some of the existing model rules and not to get too deeply into uh, local patent rules late in the day, but just some highlights. Um, they really seem to fall into three categories. One is, of course, those model rules which tee up Markman earlier in the case, like the Northern District of California, Eastern District of Texas. There are some variations between them, but fundamentally they require the exchange of um, infringement and invalidity contentions and documents within the first several months of a case, uh, leading toward a claim construction briefing and ultimately a hearing, usually within the first year, um, and certainly much shorter uh, in many cases. Um, and they, um, other courts, of course, don't impose those kind of requirements. In Delaware, the model scheduling order is very wide open. Each judge can decide how they want to sort of manage uh, their markman. Although their e-discovery order uh, seems to really uh, push people to exchange information early. Um, the other uh, piece of it uh, includes sort of the e-discovery orders that are variants of what Ed described, and I, so I won't go into great detail there. Uh, probably the most interesting um, model order that I saw was the Texas Track B uh, model order, which was implemented in February of this year. And as part of the exchange of information, um, it includes licensing and damages information early in the case. So prior to the initial scheduling conference, very, very early, um, the parties, uh, for example, the patentee is going to give the in, uh, infringement contentions within 14 days of the answer, as well as all licenses and settlement agreements which I think is a really interesting uh, addition. Um, and then the defendant serves um, 20, Rules 26 initial disclosures within 30 days, including all sales information of the accused product and any products likely to be accused. So uh, a little bit tough to kind of guess what your opponent might want to capture. Um, within 14 days of that, the plaintiff has to provide a good faith damages estimate, which is non-binding. Right, so it's just essentially the point of this is to give the court a general sense of the dollar amount in dispute so that when the parties show up for the scheduling conference, there can be an intelligent discussion about how much discovery is worth it, how much trial time is needed, in other words, I suppose, how much process is due. And so it also presumably, and I'm guessing, might get the parties in a place where they could at least have a better sense of the value of their own and their opponent's case very early on. So I, I, we all obviously have and have had cases in ED techs. What do you guys expect is going to come out of this track B, and do you see any potentially unintended consequences, as we've heard over the course of the day, as something to guard for when making these sorts of changes? Well, I can say I, I don't think it's going to be useful or productive. Um, one, the idea that sort of what gets foregrounded is how much money you might have to pay rather than whether you ought to be required to pay it at all strikes me as putting the cart before the horse. Um, expecting that the plaintiff's non-binding estimate of what their damages are going to be is going to bear any actual relationship to what the damages will prove to be at the end of the day also strikes me as being unrealistic. I think that number is going to have more to do with the size of the company that they are targeting and less to do with the actual economic substance of the case. Um, I, I think it is intended to be a lever to try to drive early settlements rather than to fa facilitate intelligent case management. Um, and I don't think, I, I think if anything, it is counterproductive for that reason. Anybody else have a view? Um, I, I mean, I, uh, I guess I'm a more uh, more optimistic that maybe something will come of it. I mean, I'm hoping it's not just to you know, it won't be misused as part of the tool of the the um, 
nuisance settlement but business model. I, I, my, I, my understanding is the intent is at least that it facilitates potentially early claim construction on key terms in cases where you can eliminate them, and Judge Davis has done that before. Um, I, I think in terms of my client base and what I would say, I actually think that it's a little bit more case to case. If there's a, a, a situation where your revenue figures are your revenue figures, and there's not a major entire market <coughs> value rule question, then just turning over what those numbers are, which will often be public information anyway, you're not giving anything up by doing that, and maybe you're getting some ex expedited performance. If you're in a situation where you know, it's a shopping cart and they want all your revenues and, and things like that and you're a private company, then obviously it's, it's, it's not going to be for you. So I'm a little bit more looking at it from a case by case. I, I do want to take a moment out, as I like to do, for PSA, which is to say, you know, I serve as chair of the Federal Circuit Advisory Council and the, and the Northern District Patent Rules Committee, and, and part of what I should do is that is take inputs from the public, and this is an interested public if there ever was one, if anyone has any ideas or thoughts relating to those bodies that are appropriately within their purview, you know, feel free to contact me. That's one of the things I'm supposed to be doing to do my job, and I welcome that. But with respect to the, the, the track B, I, I'm, I'm a little more open to it, and I think it's a little more case by case. If it weeds out some of the bottom feeder cases out there that are causing so much angst, uh, more power to it. Matt, would you select it for any of your cases? Uh, the cases are going to be too large to, be, to fit within it. Okay. Um, well, then I guess with that, uh, you know, we've, we've kicked around some potential legislation, existing attempts at addressing uh, litigation abuse. Uh, I'd like to just hear from each of the panelists what you would do, you know, if, if you had the power, dictatorial power, say, to implement some change to the, the current patent system, what would you do to rein in uh, perceived or actual litigation abuse? Maybe start with you, Darylin. I would like to see a mechanism for early dispositive motions um, across the board in a way that was less, uh, less forum specific um, with some presumptive timelines around when you could get um, judicial resolution. Um, I realize that's not going to happen in my lifetime, um, but I, I, to me, the sort of the overriding theme from my perspective is, you know, to the extent we're talking about sort of, you know, quality of adjudication and, you know, writing a 50-page opinion, um, there's a class of cases where I would trade, um, you know, sort of an incredibly detailed assessment on the basis of a fully developed evidentiary record for the ability to get um, some swift justice. I guess mine would be to have active, efficient, time-sensitive judicial management of discovery. Uh, from, from a plaintiff's perspective, particularly if you're on a contingent fee basis, your motivation and judgment is to be as efficient as possible, and the defendants generally prove to be, let's give as little as possible until we're absolutely forced to. And we're going to make you file motion after motion to get it, and then, and then we're even, even then we're not going to do it. Uh, and if you had a phone call with a judge, a magistrate judge, somebody who was empowered to order them to do it once a week, uh, once every two weeks, where you could raise it by a very short letter and identify what's going on, most of the issues don't need more than that, uh, then having that regular stick come down once a week, once every two weeks is a good way of, of curbing that behavior and will curb a lot of the abuse and expense that people are complaining about. If I'm truly the dictator, I think I would uh, first choose an independent invention defense. Just go ahead and make copying part of in patent infringement. Um, the other thing I would say that's maybe more realistic is increasing the number and size of patent maintenance fee payments. Right? We could think of litigation costs as a form of pollution that patents create that is not priced into the price of getting a patent, right? Just back of the envelope calculation, let's say there's two million patents in force today, and on an annual basis, those patents create something like $20 billion of, let's say, socially wasteful litigation costs, right? Then we're looking at a maintenance fee payment that's something like $10,000 per year per patent. The current level works out to something like $750 per year per patent. Uh, let's ratchet up the maintenance fees to $10,000 a year, see what survives, and I might feel a lot more confident that what makes its way to court is uh, high value. 
I, I guess when I read the proposed legislation, my thought was that this is a procedural solution that exists at a moment in time, right? I mean, we've been collecting information about what's going out there in, in the courts and what are the biggest problems today. But I, I do think Robin uh, Feldman is right, that we have to look ahead a little bit. And I also um, am responding to Matt's point about um, the lack of data. And also um, Michael's point about we've had a patent system since 1790. And I guess I think the problems are, are not necessarily deep and unsolvable, but I would like to know what a field would look like if we didn't have any patents at all. And so I, if I were the dictator, I would say, and, and please excuse me for this academic sort of proposal, which would be to do a very carefully controlled sort of voluntary opt-in program that allows new entrants to sort of get out of the patent system for a little while and give them a patent immunity and don't let them apply for a patent. And how you would do that is to ask them to, to maybe do um, a patent application or an immunity application in this case and maybe give it gold-plated kind of fabulous review by 17 patent examiners who know exactly what they're doing and let the company do what they do. And you could have it as few as one company, you could have it as few as 10. It could be scalable or to work in particular fields better than others, so you could choose a field. Um, and you could have a willfulness exclusion to it. So if someone's truly copying, then they shouldn't have that immunity. You could make it qualified. But I would be very curious to see what would happen. And it might be good and it might be terrible, but I, since it's voluntary, <coughs> right, if people are sort of opting in of their own free will, you know, maybe the people that are saying patents aren't good for me, well, let them see what it's like. Maybe they would do wonderful things and maybe not, but that's what I would try. Amy, you're not much of a dictator if you're making it voluntary. Let me oh. just point that out. <laughs> but, yeah. My first wish would be to return the system back to the way it is from the way Amy just made it. No, I'm just <laughs> um, uh, but but uh, if I can't eliminate the uh, Supreme Court from uh, touching a patentable subject matter case again and, and removing their last four decisions, um, I would uh, try to address the problem of uh, mass customer litigation. I, I mean, you, you just need to sit in, God forbid, one, two, or three of these joint defense calls where you have 20, 30 expensive lawyers debating the bowels of a protective order to just get depressed. I mean, it's just, it's, I don't know, I just get, it's depressing for me, <laughs> the amount of money and waste that goes into it, and then that leverage turns into these small-time settlements. Uh, you know, as always, the solution's harder than defining the problem. My solution would be empowering the true source of the technology to come in on a declaratory judgment basis without all the roadblocks and barriers that the law seems <clears> to put on, uh, mindlessly put on them and let them come in. And if someone's willing to step up and take the responsibility for the litigation, I don't know why in the world we would ever say you can't do that. It doesn't make any sense to me. If someone's saying, we're coming forward, we really <coughs> think it's our product, we want to protect it. And the system saying, nah, you don't have, you don't have enough legal adversity. Uh, anyway, there's all these, there's 60 cases in Texas where all your customers are ready, though they were first, so that venue gets the, I mean, that, that doesn't make any sense. That's what I would do. Okay, uh, we have a couple of minutes left. Uh, does anybody have any questions, any comments, anything they'd like to point out? Sir? Okay, so two things. One, I, I thought I was the only person who thought it was ridiculous to put claim charts in a complaint. So. Hearing a defense person say that is very heartening. Hopefully Congress will listen to that. But that leads to a, my general question, which is how much of this is really driven by the fact that we can't make district judge, judges do what we want them to do? In some districts, we have really great rules that, where the judges spend a lot of time coming up with procedures we think get us to more efficient solutions. I'd be interested in a study to see whether the costs are less in those districts. I doubt it. Uh, maybe they are. Uh, 
but then we have a bunch of other districts where they don't do that. And the problem is the only way to make that happen because we have these rules that we can't tell judges how to run their courtrooms is to make laws about pleadings. And so we wind up with stupid laws about pleadings and mandatory fee shifting because we can't make judges uh, grant Rule 11 sanctions on things we think are frivolous. Yeah, let me take a little bit of that, which is, I, I think early ca active case management is only going to happen with certain judges and not others, and there's nothing that we can legislate or otherwise that's going to change that. That's a reality. I think what you're leaving out a little bit on the pleading thing is that was a product of the fact of Form 18 is binding the judiciary to a standard that I don't think there's any people that, there's not many people that would defend it. So the standard is locked in, it's so low that the discussion becomes how high and then people take different views on that and you heard a range, a colorful range of what they should be here. So the real root problem is that we have a ridiculous standard now that no one's really willing to defend. I mean, even the judiciary's finally gotten around to eliminating that come December 2015. Um, and so something has to replace that. I think so people, I'm at least, my concern on that front, and then I'll let others address is, that there's some case law trying to harmonize things, people like Harmony, and say, well, the Rule 18 is actually the real Iqbal standard, so that if we eliminate Rule 18, we might, we might be bound and locked back into that as the, as the Iqbal standard and not get meaningful pleadings. Um, so, you know, I think that's why there's, there's statutes on that. But, and I don't, and the other, thing I'd say is I don't think the pleadings are the area where the early case management's not a problem. Judges are used to pleading motions. If you gave them a standard of it should have claims, it should have this, it should have that, as long as we're not getting carried away into putting them into summary judgment motions, I think they would do that. But you're right about early case management absence by judges is a root problem of the over bigger, the bigger problem. I, I think the answer also has to do with how much do we want uniformity? I mean, if there's a foreign shopping, foreign shopping problem, right? That's, you can make judges address these things, but they'll address them in different ways, and maybe we like that. But if you want uniformity, that's got to come from somewhere. All right, thank you very much, panel. Um, you know, it seems to me that there's three categories of patents or companies or entities that litigate. The first category are companies who are practicing in the field, have product, and are genuinely trying to keep an infringing competitor out. The second category is uh, uh, a company that's still practicing, but they want to keep a competitor out who hasn't even entered or um, hasn't, has a product that doesn't quite infringe, but they still want to keep them out and or assert something defensively. The third category is a non-practicing non entity or troll. I know we've started to go a little bit, talk about uh, different standards for trolls, but if we could go back to the dictator world, and we have these three categories, could I ask the panel, could you come up with three different sets of rules, or, or more succinctly, any major differences between those three categories? Um, even I am not in favor of trying to um, create different sets of rules for those different categories. Um, notwithstanding that I do think a huge part of the problem arises from NPE cases, not, the, not, not all the problem, but a, but a significant portion of the problem. Um, one, it just strikes me as sort of uh, wrong-headed and wrong to think that different rules ought to apply on the basis of whether or not the entity is in fact practicing the patent. And, and that's a, a slippery line because, as you know, there are plenty of instances where you have companies that are companies that are making products, but they may not be practicing the particular patent in question. Um, you've got universities that are non-practicing entities, but as Ed was alluding to, that doesn't necessarily mean the litigation is not righteous. Um, uh, and, and, and I also think you are going to spawn then sort of a lot of ancillary litigation over whether you're a practicing entity or not. And frankly, you know, it's not that hard to create the, in some instances, it's not that hard to create the fig leaf of a product that you can contend is practicing the patent, you know, especially in the internet space, um, simply as a way to avoid and evade those kinds of rules. So it strikes me that we're better off coming up with a sensible set of rules that everyone's going to be able to live with across the board. Does anybody else want to win? I have no desire to make separate rules for those three entities. I think it's a practical matter. The remedies that the third category are going to get are going to be, are going to be and should be different, which, and to be concrete, 
injunction should be less likely in that case, and royalty should be more likely than lost <coughs> profits in that case. But I don't, you know, personally, and just to address, you know, as a defense lawyer, I mean, I, I do things all across. I'm a plaintiff's lawyer for Stanford in major litigation, so, you know, I, I wouldn't want to rule us out as being... Okay, well, thank you all for being an attentive audience, and thanks to the panel. That was great. Mm -hmm.